Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. We're up on the fourth floor of 2660 Reba Road, which is in the county office complex. And we've been doing the local business spotlights for probably about two years. Then we had a year uh, during COVID where we did uh, reruns, uh, which is sort of like the off-season of a television show. But we said, hey, if we're talking about business in Anne Arundel County, we probably should talk to the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corp. And we are here today with the CEO of the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corp., Ben Burge. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Thank you very much for finally connecting. It was uh, not that we've tried that long. I know I called and I said, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. But uh, I don't know why it took me so long to say, you know, this is what we need to talk about because we're all about local businesses in Anne Arundel County. And that's what you do. It's not surprising that there would be a situation where when you're talking about local businesses or, uh, you know, a big or small, you know, single person or large corporation, we're not the first thing you think of. Um, We're kind of behind the scenes, connecting the dots for businesses. So um, it's not surprising that it takes a while to get around to us. Well, you know, it's it's funny. There's a lot of things in in life in general that you and, and I find as I get to know more and more about the county and the state and the city and everything else, there are so many different programs, assets, resources, and everything else that people just don't know about. And I, I mean, you look at like SCORE, the group of retired executives that come in and can advise businesses that are coming up. And here, here are guys that just are just brilliant in what they've done. And I say guys, I use that as unisex, guys and gals that are doing this. But to be able to really give the leg up that a business might need. Hey, you know, I've got a unique, I mean, there are no unique problems in business. Somebody has gone through it at some point in time and and figured out a way to work through it or something similar. And, you know, I wanted to talk with the Economic Development Corp to find out exactly what it is that you do and, you know, how you can help businesses, whether they're existing or, hey, you know, I think I want to move to Anne Arundel County and start a business type of a position. Well, You really captured what we do in a nutshell with your question, which is we really can help businesses at any step of the process, whether it's a mature business that's been around for 75 or 100 years that's looking to grow or move or add employees or or maybe contract, and they need some assistance with that, whatever it is to help them. Or it could be a, a single sole proprietor someone who's just working out of their home and has a business. It could be someone who's been around a while. It could be someone who says, you know, everyone tells me I make the world's greatest chicken pot pie and that I should sell it. So how do I start a business to do that? And we can help them. So literally every point in between, every size business in between on that whole spectrum, we can help with a lot of programs, a lot of resources, sometimes with financing programs. But you touched on one of the tools, which is SCORE, which I think is just one of the most essential and useful resources we have at our disposal. And they help businesses at the very beginning. And and actually saying they help businesses is a bit limiting. They help people before they're even businesses. They help explain to them what they need, just the basics to get off the ground, how to put together a business plan, how to... Oh, did you know you need to keep your books this way? And just basically introducing them to the world of business. And then for some of our smaller businesses that are looking to grow and looking to stay viable, we have our Small Business Development Center, which is run out of the University of Maryland, but they have staff here that work with our local businesses. Uh, They have them all over the state. So we send some businesses there. Like I said, we send some people to SCORE. We have all kinds of other resources. We have workforce training programs. We have financing programs, whether that's uh, low or no interest loans. Just a, a whole variety of programs and resources, depending on what the business is, and most importantly, depending on what the goals are of that business owner. Not every business owner wants to be the biggest business on the block. Sometimes they want to keep it small sure. or they want to stay in a particular area. And knowing how to survive and reach those goals is just as important as 
being tied to the right resources to stay that way. So are you looking, I mean, I'm part of your job, I mean, is working with businesses. You're looking to attract businesses to come into Anne Arundel County as well as existing businesses that want to grow or change, let's just say, because you said the contraction yes. might be. Yes, I, I would say we spend a lot more time with the retention and strengthening and growth of our local businesses. That's probably the same thing as like cost you 10 times more to get a new customer than it does to keep an existing one. Right. And we have tens of thousands of businesses in the county. So it is absolutely worth our time, worth our effort, worth our resources to maintain those than spending an inefficient amount of time chasing the next one or two or three Right. So, because Amazon's going to Northern Virginia, <laughs> Amazon's heading to Northern Virginia, but NSA's not going anywhere. So, <laughs> knock on wood. Um, I'll take that trade off any day of the week. <laughs> hey, now, Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation. Okay, you've got the county name in your title. Are you a county organization? Are you a private organization? What's how's the structure here? The legal definition would be that we're a five hundred one c three that is officially chartered by the county. So we are an official arm of the county, but we are a nonprofit organization. So I think when you look at it in terms of our function, we look and act like a regular county agency. We are the business liaison for the county. So we're officially designated as that. Okay. So if a county councilman comes in here, you guys get all nervous and stuff like that, right? Oh, my gosh, yes. Okay. (laughs) So each county does their economic development differently. Some are are like this, where it's a 501c3 within the county. There are some counties where it is part of the government. It's, It's an official agency of the government. Some, it's very independent where the board makes a lot more of the decisions than even the county does. Anne Arundel is a little unique in that I'm the only county employee in AAEDC. The rest of the team are employees of the corporation. But again, if you look at the way we interact, we adopt a lot of the policies by the county. We are in a county building. We are very much part of the county government. And I imagine the 501c3 is probably very beneficial as far as going out for grants and, and being able to participate in any number of different things as well. Yes, it's, it's beneficial in a lot of ways like that. A lot of times when you have programs that span multiple years, you don't have to worry about starting and stopping on a fiscal year. Where it really pays off, though, is when we do our loans. It's really hard for a government agency to loan money sure. like we do to businesses. And be a government That's agency. why they have embezzlers. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. But you'll see a lot of our counterparts around the state don't do that. They have another arm that does that, or they don't get involved at all. I know out in Western Maryland, the economic development resources are spread out differently. But really, they operate differently based on the needs of the jurisdiction. I know of some of your success stories. I mean, I've watched the... Uh you guys also do a business brief with the uh, some of the success stories that you've had. I've seen several of them. And like you mentioned, the guy that makes the great chicken pot pies, uh, even though they may not do chicken pot pies, but I'd say Jesse Jay's down in South County mm-hmm. is probably one of those chicken pot pie companies. This is a young couple that had an idea and uh, has morphed uh, not only into a very successful business that was able to survive COVID and thrive during COVID, but has become one of my go-to Latin joints that I have no problem driving 30, 35 minutes to go enjoy. It really gives our team an enormous amount of satisfaction to see us be able to work with a small business who's basically trying to convert their talent into a business opportunity. And that's what a place like Jesse J's does is they're good at something. How can we capitalize on that? Working with them has been great. We've worked with them a lot of steps of the way. We've worked with a lot of businesses that started off like that that grew into large businesses, but they reached out. They were able to get guidance. They were able to get financial support. They were able to grow and really outgrow things that even we can offer them. And when they get to that point, we say, hey, you might want to talk to a bank because we can only loan you this much. Sure, We have had a lot that we've gotten off the ground, but we've also had a lot that we've seen get off the ground and really mature and grow beyond anything any of us imagined. Well, you're kind of like a uh, the kindergarten teacher, if you will. Okay, everybody, we need to hold hands while we're crossing the street. I mean, you can hold hands from the get-go. If I knew nothing about the county or the city, I mean, 
oh, I need a permit for that. Oh, you mean I need to do this? You know, and it's very complex. I mean, yeah, okay, you've got the IRS filings and you, commercial bank accounts and the whole nine yards. That's fairly obvious things, but there's a lot of less obvious things about doing business in Anne Arundel County. And I'm not picking on the county because it's the same whether you're in the city of Annapolis or in Harper County or Montana or wherever you are. But there are some idiosyncrasies that, and this is where I imagine you come in to be able to handle it. I mean, you've got people that work with agriculture. You've got people that work with retail. You've got people that work, I imagine, that are strictly uh, on the lending arm that can facilitate. And it's about relationships, I guess. You know, you work with a local bank. I don't believe AADC has $10 million to loan in a year, but you certainly know that the Bank of Glen Burnie or Severn Bank or whatever does, and you've got that relationship and you can turn around and say, hey, Alan Hyatt, look at this guy. We believe in this. We think they've got a good plan. Take a look. What do you think? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the only thing I would say is instead of being the kindergarten teacher, I think we're more like the teacher in the schoolhouse and little house on the prairie where we have the kindergartners. We're walking across the street. I also have the advanced STEM kids in the other side of the room, and we're teaching them all at once. That's why we have a team to handle all of that instead of just one person trying to facilitate. But you're right. It's navigating the regulatory process while we're seeing what their financial needs are in case there's a loan that's needed, while we're making sure, is this the right site for you, while we're sending them to another resource to get marketing advice. You know, it's just a whole bunch of things. And and the bigger they get, the more complex it gets. Sure. And really what is impressive about this team is their knowledge, not of what we can do to help, but where they can also send them. This team is excellent at finding the right resource, not just the best resource we have. We'll send them to the state to get resources. We'll send them to banks. We'll send them to wherever it is that's needed. We don't have pride of ownership that if a business can only be as successful as we're able to support it, that's not what we do. We will direct them to SBDC to find federal support. We'll direct them to the State Department of Commerce or TEDCO or whoever at the state level to find resources there. Whatever fits them, that's where our expertise comes in, not just on what we have. What types of businesses are coming to Anne Arundel County? What do you, I mean, is there any trends that you're seeing? I mean, are we, you know, I'm going to say, I mean, we're very little geographically wise, we're probably a little bit larger, but I mean, there's probably very few agriculture new businesses. Oh, you'd be surprised. We're finding that there are some new farmers buying maybe what used to be larger farms and buying smaller parts of them. Uh, Younger farmers coming in and having a different approach to doing farming, but want to get into it. But the new ones coming in are skewing much younger which is a really interesting trend. Now, to answer the big picture question about what kind of businesses are coming into Anne Arundel County, that is a difficult answer, I should say, to quantify because businesses don't register with us. A business may set up, be successful for 10 years and go under, and we never knew they existed. We only know what we go out and beat the bushes and find out. Social media has been enormously helpful to us to increase our business knowledge, our business intel about what's going on. So because businesses are not required to register in a uniform way in order to exist, it's hard to quantify that question. But here's what we do know. We do know that every time something happens in the world, a national security issue somewhere, anywhere in the globe, Fort Meade grows. And when Fort Meade grows, our cyber community grows our defense contracting grows. That's kind of a constant. That's going to be a growth industry long after I'm gone from here. Right. But we're still trolling the social media sites and finding out that way and working. I, I would be remiss. I would be embarrassed if I forgot to mention the incredible amount of information we get from our chambers of commerce in this county enormously helpful partners in all this. We get information from them about businesses starting. We're still seeing a lot of restaurants start up. We saw restaurants popping up during the pandemic. It was amazing. I'm very fortunate to be able to go to ribbon cuttings during a pandemic. That is the most satisfying thing in the world (laughs) to watch a business be able to get up off the ground during those times. So we're seeing business expansions. Um, I, I went to a ribbon cutting in South County for uh, someone who opened up an auto body shop. That, that's a business that's never going to go away. I mean, people may be driving a little less. 
but now they're driving a little crazier and that guy's going to be doing well. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've seen that statistic on the statewide. <laughs> yes. So we're seeing small businesses continue to grow. We're seeing, unfortunately, the businesses that were hit hardest in the early stages of the pandemic were our minority owned businesses and our women owned businesses disproportionately devastated by the pandemic. We're seeing some of them make comebacks, but because they were hit hardest and their growth is slower, we're trying to focus some of our resources in that direction. That makes sense. Why do you think that they were hit hardest? I think there's a lot of reasons. One is they're smaller. The smaller businesses got hit harder. If you think about why people went out of their house to buy things, right. they went to Target, or Sam's Club, where they'll come and they'll drop stuff off in your designated parking spot, and you don't have to interact with a person. Okay. So smaller retail, you know, that, that flows down. Same with restaurants. If you were able to make that quick Drive switch over pick to pick up, that helps. But also, as we're starting to come out of this, and the employment picture is changing, you look at the restaurant hospitality industry – struggling for employees, they're, the smaller ones are competing with the larger hotels, the larger chain restaurants who are offering better salaries and better working conditions. Um, when I say working the, conditions, I just mean right. sta- steady hours and sure. regular, more, more consistency. And that's just having an appeal. So that's hurting. So it's not just the lack of customers. It's just being able to, to provide com- to your product on and serve it. There was a study that we like to reference a lot that was out of uh, UC Santa Cruz that showed that in the first three months of the pandemic, 40% of minority-owned businesses were either out of business or close to going out of business. That's a huge number. And it was about a third of the Latino-owned businesses and a third of women-owned businesses. Disproportionately, they are the ones getting hit. Well, that's that's a good segue. And, And you guys, in the midst of all this, uh, launched a program called IVP, which was Inclusive Ventures Program. Yes. And as it turns out, I did a local business spotlight with Jeanette Kruzberg, who was with Solo Day Marketing, which is one of the participants. And you kept it pretty close to the best as far as who was participating. And then when I found out she was participating, I'm like, wait a minute, you like held held back on me. So I made her redo the whole thing again to talk a little bit about that. But, you know, Keisha Haith, who works on your team, spearheaded that. And that was a um, great program. I mean, it was a minority program and you could define minority however you wanted. It could be, you know, it could be, you know, black women, Asian veteran. You know, veteran, Eskimo, Aleutian, you know, everything else that, that falls within that definition. But you gave them a full on, it was, I believe, a six week intense mentoring program. Hey, let's talk about your books. Let's talk about how you have to do the account. Let's talk about your legal issues that you need to do with. And you had to be an existing business. It wasn't for startups. You had to have business and some revenue, I think, for a year or something like that. Two years, right. And it was a really, it was sort of like a, a crash course in Let's figure out how to get back into business, how to succeed and take art to the next level. And that that next step could have been just a little step or it could have been a giant leap. And it was probably different for everybody. But I've spoken with a couple of people that were in it. And I mean, they're like, wow. And in the end, uh, they got a $5,000 grant, uh, which is, you know, seed money, whether it could be used to upgrade software for accounting or whatever it may be. But was that a success as far as AADC is concerned? I know it was for the people that participated. I've been fortunate in my career to be involved with a lot of intellectually stimulating, incredibly helpful to people projects that are also just really cool. This one is among the best programs I've ever been involved with. And I I couldn't have been prouder of the team for the way they executed it. If I can step back a little bit and take the the 50,000 foot view of why this program is so important. We know that with these businesses, and we knew this before the pandemic, that the structural discrimination that exists in our society that makes it difficult for minorities and women and veterans to succeed in the job place, we we know it exists. We know that it's not a question of hiring. It's a question of promotion. We know that these employees They may be hired at a certain rate to satisfy some goal that an organization has. But once they're on board, are they trusted to make real business decisions? Are they being promoted into management? Are they responsible for the books? We know the answer to those questions is no. Right. So what we have found with all of these demographic groups, these underserved groups, is that they're very high on skill set. 
but lack experience because they were never trusted to be moved upward through an organization. The IVP program helps to bridge that gap, to give that, like you said, very intensive, very hands-on. It's a very small cohort, 12 people. We're not turning this into a, a you know those MOOCs, those those massive you're, you're, online. You're not running Riva Trace Baptist Church to, to to put on the right. This is not a webinar. It's not a TED Talk. It's not these training packages you can buy. It is hands on, one on one. Roll the sleeves up and let's and get they into they it. absolutely get into it. And you mentioned the grant. The grant was very specifically set at a level that would bring in that type of business where $5,000 actually mattered. Sure. It's very strategic. And what also I think is going to be one of the important parts of this is for a year, these graduates will have access, free access to mentors in human resources, in law, in accounting. So we're not just saying, here's your knowledge, now go succeed. No, they stay tethered with us. As so, they see so fit for a six, year. Six months down the road, Jeanette runs into a problem that she didn't see coming or other than She has a resource. There's, there's a phone that she can pick yes. up and call and they and can work together. One thing, when, when we launched this program back in March, and we had, a, we had a big event around that, and the county executive mentioned something that he wanted to see out of it, which I, I thought he, he captured it very well. He said, we want these folks to work together in this program so that it creates kind of a like we have a, a leadership Anne Arundel program or a leadership Maryland program where it's a sort of minor, tiny leadership program where these business owners stay in touch. They've been in the trenches together, right? Right. So we've set up a LinkedIn page just for them. And I can't guarantee what it's going to look like in three years, but I can tell you when we had that graduation ceremony, they were a unit. They were, I mean, tight. They were a team. And they were tight. They were very tight. And I can absolutely see them collaborating, reaching out to each other, referring people to each other. Well, that makes all the sense in the world. I mean, even if you, you look at one of the mentors and, you know, you as, as a young business owner, you may be skeptical of what, what the old, the old guy's telling you. I mean, He's so 1980s, you know, or something along those lines to be able to reach out to, you know, somebody that's within your posse to yes. sit there and say, hey, you think he's on the mark there or how do we to, to work off of one another there? Are you going to be doing more of those? Yes. In fact, we're reviewing applications already for the fall cohort. I, I'm presuming that that would be on your wish list, that that would continue indefinitely. As long, and it doesn't seem like it's a huge thing to fund. You were talking about well, 60000 in grants plus the cost to run it. Right. So rough ballpark, it's about 100000 a class when you consider the grants. The mentors. The, and, the, men, the right. instruction, all that. So the ballpark number. And the balloons at the graduation ceremony. The balloons at the graduation. That's right. So I don't want to make this – it would be misleading if I said this was all about money because it's not. It's also about we're not going to grow this by another person or by another cohort unless we're confident we have the right instruction in place and the right mentors in place and the right people providing the content. That comes first. And how is that measured? Is that measured by the success of the people that have come before? A bit. It's also business intel. It's about our team going out and looking at the content and looking at the structure and working with the, the instructor to say, this is the way we want it done. We don't want a classroom of 30 people. We want very deep one-on-one, -on -one, 10 to 12 people, very personal, very intimate so there's a lot of negotiation around the right provider with the right content, with the right experience working with these types of businesses, which is why I can't just go out and hire any old trainer off the street to do this. Right, um, right. There may be a lot out there, and I'd love to find them, but we are picky, and we are not going to take this lightly. It sort of segues into a question. I had a conversation with Laura Fritz, who used to do economic development for the city of Annapolis a long time ago, I think uh, probably under the Cohen administration. Do you find that there are businesses that really, and I, I don't want to use the word too bad, but don't deserve or just the business owners just aren't good business people. They just don't get it. I mean, I, I had the conversation with her. I said, you know, you have to have the conversation at some point saying, you know, maybe owning your own business is not for you. You know, I mean, you see businesses fall. I mean, they say that what, what is it you probably would know that if you made it five years, there's a good chance that you can continue on. Right. It's the first five years that you're going to fail. I see time and time again, I, and I'll pick on Main Street businesses in Annapolis. I've been after them. I said, the dynamics of the consumer has changed. Why are you playing in this nine-to-five role as a store? 
Okay, we Ward and June Cleaver died. Okay, they're not they're not here anymore. What's happening now is that, you know, Frank and Mary Smith both have jobs. They've got two kids. The lawn's getting shaggy. The deck needs painting. The 40-hour work week is done. Let's face it. Okay, they're working 50, maybe 60 hours a week. They get home at 7 o'clock at night. They quick mow the lawn. So, of course, your business is contracting. Why don't you turn around, open at noon, and stay open till 9? Try it once. And I get this. Well, we tried that before. And it didn't work. Well, when did you try that? Well, back in 1972. I'm like, okay, well, Ward and June were alive then. <laughs> you know, it's frustrating to me. And again, that a lot of business I've seen that I've talked to them and say, like, hey, who's your competition? And, you know, you might talk to a uh, clothing store and they're like, oh, well, it's Nordstrom and it's this and that. And I said, well, what about Home Depot? Best Buy? Well, no, why? why? Why are they my competition? I said, well, let's take your product out of it. What are you competing for? You're competing for what's in the wallet that somebody is willing to spend. And it could be the travel agency. It could be anything. And you need to really focus on getting to the people and giving them the experience that you want. And that's where really being a good businessman and being a good businesswoman and and knowing how to get into it really pays dividends, I think. There's no question. There's nothing but validity to what you're saying. We would never approach someone and just tell them, you shouldn't do this. We do have a lot of programs and a lot of resources. And a lot of these groups are partners who provide guidance and advice and say, you know, you might be better off relocating. You might be better off instead of being here, moving a couple miles over there where the where the rent is two thirds of the cost and you have better visibility and try to work with them to make their business successful rather than just saying, you know, I don't think this is going to work now. At the same time, we're not quite like that with our loan programs, where the underwriting evaluation that goes into that is legit and it's hardcore, and you have to have your ducks in a row if you're going to get a loan. That's a whole different ballgame, though. But when we're talking about some of these other uh, structural issues about what you're selling, how you're selling, where you're selling, things like that, we're going to try and advise them before we tell them to hang it up. It's just like in... I spent 11 years working in higher education. I'm not going to go look at a, at a high school transcript and say, you know, my model suggests to me that you're not going to finish college. No, you provide them the resources and the advice and say, you might want to major in this instead of that. You might want to do this instead of that. And we try to help them along that way. It's not always successful. There's no question about right. it. And sometimes the businesses will say, I don't really want to do that. And they do fold up. And we know we're not going to save every business. We're going to do everything we can to give them options to stay around. It's If there's one perception I would like to change about maybe what we do is we spend so much more time on building business resiliency than we do business attraction, trying to draw someone from out of state or out of county or whatever. It's about strengthening what we have here and making sure they stay in place. AAEDC.org is the website that you want to go. And that's when should somebody, I mean, that's the great starting point for anybody that is in business or looking to get into business or even just has some harebrained scheme. What types of businesses are you as the business or entity in Anne Arundel County looking to attract? And I mean, the easy answer is going to say all types because uh, they, they can all survive here. But I mean, do you find that where you are, you've mentioned Fort Meade a couple of times, are we heavy in the tech and the military consulting that we could use more agriculture, we could use more retail, we could use more hospitality, or do we have a pretty good mix? Or We have an amazing mix. I'd like to flip that question a bit. It's not the type of business we're looking to attract. I, I, I don't want to be the person who, uh, you know, socially engineers what type of businesses we have. That doesn't always work out. I'm not quite that smart. What we do know is Anne Arundel County is a very attractive place for businesses to locate. It is a proven track record. You can fall out of bed and businesses are going to move here without us lifting a finger. At the same time, rather than focusing on how many businesses we bring to the county and what type, We have areas of the county that are deficient in very significant industries. Sure, we have businesses that move here all the time, yet we have food deserts. We have areas without good retail options, without restaurants and things like that. So we try to make sure that our underserved communities, we work a little bit harder with them to try and attract the type of businesses that will help those communities Rather than just thinking on the industry-wide sector for countywide, 
which we do, but we also spend a lot of time at the community level making sure that the right types of businesses are going in the communities to fit with those residents. So sort of like spreading butter on toast, just making sure that it's all we you know, all, all, all over. Absolutely. But we do a bit of compartmentalization because some of these communities, like we work with the Odenton Town Center. We work with the community on out on 198. And we work with communities like up in Brooklyn Park and Glen Burnie. Those folks have very different needs. And we don't want to be cookie cutter about it. We want to, when we have the opportunity, steer businesses there if it's a good fit for them, but also work with those communities to make it enticing for those businesses to want to move there. So it's a bit of both, but making sure that we get rid of some of our disparities and some of our underserved communities is, is something we can play a role in. In your time here at Anne Arundel Economic Development Corp., what's your, um, excluding the IVP, because I think that's going to be the easy answer, but what's it your is. biggest chest-thumping success story that you've got? And it could be a business, you, you know, I mean, is it one business that has just taken off or? This team did such an amazing job during the pandemic on distributing grants. This is something that no economic development agency did. Oh, I forgot all about that, man. You got you guys were on point. We killed it. So this team, it started with some conversations with the county executive about helping small businesses. This is in the early days of the pandemic about, you know, safety protocols and plexiglass and, right. you know, hand sanitizer. And this team figured out a way to take in the information get the money into the hands of small businesses in a pretty effective way. Turns it was, out it was quick. It was quick, but it was complicated and the bookkeeping was challenging, but at the same time we have to remember the environment at that time. In April of last year when we had the CARES Act and we had 112 million dollars come to the county from the federal government with a lot of strings attached as to how to use it. So we had to be a little bit more meticulous about setting up rules and guidelines. And all the other counties went through this too. After that, to their credit, the federal government realized that a lot of these, we, we got to get rid of some of these strings. So we were able to do that, be a little bit less uh, you know, onerous about looking at every little thing and every right. little budget item. And we gave out, because I have the number here, $31.4 million. It's amazing to almost 2,100 small businesses and nonprofits. And I can tell you we did it faster than any other economic development organization in the state. And we did it with a higher level of accountability. And most importantly, we did it with a higher level of service because, and this is where we separated ourselves from the pack. We did the application review, two levels of application review, and we distributed the money. Most counties... The Economic Development Organization reviews the applications, puts it in a spreadsheet, sends it over to the county's finance office. They cut the checks, which adds about two weeks to the process. Okay. I'm sorry, but if, if no, part, of this, weeks, goal, two, two, two part of this goal is to help businesses who are struggling during a pandemic, every day counts. Sure. We were able to get money out the door faster than anybody. I'm not going to name names, but we wrapped up our nonprofit program two weeks ago. A neighboring county just opened their portal a, a few days ago. So this team's ability to figure out something they had never done before that quickly, that effectively. And when I say hands, all hands on deck, literally every person in the organization was involved, including yours truly. And everybody worked on it. Everybody played a role. It was an amazing thing to watch. We did it so well, and we explained to people what we did. We provided reports that were easy to understand. These are the businesses that receive the money. This is where they're located. These are the sectors. These are the sizes. There was actually a, a bill introduced in the state Senate this year that was modeled off of our program, telling the state, when you're doing small business grants like that, do what they did. Do what they did. be curious to know how many businesses that those grants saved. And I mean, you know, I mean, it was obviously a lifeline to every single one of them. I think if you look but. at some of the testimonials, you'll get a, a, a sampling. And of course, it's it's impossible to quantify, you know, without that money was make or break. But you talk to some of the people, they would say it was make or break. It was significant. I remember, you know, the size of the businesses. It's uh, we all thought in March 16th of 2020. They were going to hunker down for a couple of weeks and, yep. and and we'll take a pill and we'll be fine. Oh, remember, you remember the schools were closed for two weeks? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, it turned into six weeks and eight weeks. And, you know, here, you know, here we are. We're just coming out of it a year and, you know, four or five months later. But it was a true lifeline. 
It was a true lifeline. Size of businesses helped have gone from you know one person shops to thousands of employees, I'm sure, for the AADC. And there is no restrictions on the types of businesses, which is kind of neat. And Anne Arundel County is very neat. I mean, they talk about Maryland being like America in miniature between, you know, from the mountains to the ocean and all that mm-hmm. in between. And Anne Arundel County is very similar, too. I know I ride uh, my bike up around BWI sometimes, and it still always freaks me out. You know, you're going up there, and there's Northrop Grumman and that big old factory-looking thing and the runways and then the field. And then all of a sudden, boom, I'm in a horse farm. Right. It's like, what the <laughs> <laughs> what is this? And they go around the corner and I'm in a... In a, in a in oh, and a, then you go by the light rail and you go... Yeah, right, right, you, right. You, you, you touch it all on that bike but, trail. But it's amazing. But we are a, uh, a very diverse county as far as what we offer. I mean, from agriculture deep and south. And you mentioned briefly uh, leadership, Anne Arundel, and I participated in the last class in uh, that just wrapped up a couple months ago. And the agriculture day was just eye-opening for me. I, I I know a lot of what's going on, but I don't know a lot about the agriculture. I was amazed you talked about the resilience of some of the farmers and the businesses and the younger farmers. There was the one that owns Holiday Farm, and um, they are growing so many different crops, but they're not hundreds of acres of corn. It's not hundreds of acres of wheat or anything like that. It's this little plot of strawberries and this little plot of lettuce or kale and over here we've got the hen house that, that produces and it's cool it's cool and i think the guy that's uh, owned as a son and he's a retired dc firefighter anybody that's looking for business we want to go to aaedc.org and that's a good place to start that is a good place to start what i like about our website is we have all these different programs all these different questions to answer And in each of those sections, it has the contact person and even their picture. So you know there's a real person on the other end of your question. And also we have an email address similarly, which is info at aaedc.org. That email will be reviewed and then sent to the appropriate person to get back to that business. So it's very personal. And we have Spanish-speaking services in-house to help out with that. Also, we, as needed, can tap into the county's language services that are run out of the Department of Aging and Disability. So they're great partners with us on that. So there's no excuse, really, if uh, any businesses. And again, this shouldn't be a thing for businesses who are struggling. It should be businesses that are doing well and want to keep doing well and want to grow and things like that. Well, you've also got to figure on the pulse of what's what's coming down the line. As you said, if something happens worldwide and Fort Meade expands or something along those lines, I mean, you're, you're going to know about that. And you're going to say, well, hey, you know, we're going to have a need for it. I know during leadership we were out at Fort Meade and they were saying that it was uh, they needed some restaurants in that uh, national office park. Yes. And they were looking at some of those. And it was like, that makes sense. I mean, that's something that you would know. Mm-hmm. Uh, as as you come down there. And I think that it, it makes all the sense in the world to you know get in touch. Speaking of retail and stuff that's coming in, I heard a rumor. Can you squash it or confirm it or give me that I can't neither confirm nor deny? It's I, I can probably tell you right now I can neither confirm nor deny, but go ahead and ask. Okay. Nordstrom's at the mall. I heard a rumor that Bloomingdale's is looking to take that over. Any? That's not a name I've heard yet. No? Okay. That, that is actually none of those three. It's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'd heard they were doing some other different things with Ward and Taylor and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But I, I I have to give a ton of credit to the management team over at Westfield because they do such a good job of touching base with us now and then saying, hey, this is kind of a thing we're looking at long term. Who, who should we be talking to? Or and, you know, they stay in touch. They, they work with the Office of Planning and Zoning. They talk to the local elected officials. And again, some of these things never come to fruition. But when they have a legit idea... They just don't want to dump it on the public and on the government. They're a role model for how to engage the government, the business community about this is kind of what we're thinking. We're not announcing anything yet, but we want to take it around the block and see if this is even feasible. And I really appreciate that very much. Well, it's funny. And and our two in Annapolis, I mean, the two main centers, uh, the Annapolis Mall, as well as uh, the Annapolis Town Center, they're sort of going through a... Renaissance, both of them, if you will. I know that the town center lost several different tenants, and they're replacing them. We've got some good new additions there. Uh, the mall certainly has the container store, which is the newest, uh, biggest one there. I know they're really working on the old Lord & Taylor spot. Bloomings Street actually kind of surprised me when I heard that. I It didn't make sense to me that somebody would be looking to take over a quarter million square feet of retail when department stores are, are, are struggling against the Internet. And that's, no, you just need to figure out a different way to do business. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. 
Ben Burge, CEO of Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation, AAEDC.org. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I appreciate you uh, inviting me up here and not having security throw me out of the offices. That's always a good sign. And you know, really, thank you for what you're doing for the local business community, especially that IVP program. And hopefully that does continue on and on and on. And uh, if anybody is listening is a minority-owned business and define minority however you want to define it, definitely go to AEDC.org. Check that out. Uh, see if you can get into you know an upcoming cohort on that if you um, are looking for some really good advice and solid mentoring. I think that's a huge success story out of, out of this office, that's for sure. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Eye on Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.